that it's actually really, really selfish to hold back the potential that you have and what you're able to give to the world. So we were just like watching videos on the news of like people being rolled out of their apartments on stretchers into, into just literally straight into like pits. My little bubble that where I all of my problems are really big all of a sudden mean nothing. If you can identify a gap in something, if you're working with somebody who you want to be at their level or you want to be in that circle, just provide some free value. Zach, thank you so much, brother. It was great getting to meet you yesterday before we came on. Usually I'm recording with guests that I met 15 minutes before we hop in front of the camera. Um, but dude, that event was amazing last night. Thank you so much for inviting me. I met so many cool people and I'm so excited to be here to talk with you. Yeah, appreciate it, Andres. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I mean, I, I like to get things rolling right off the bat. No need for any fuzz in there. You started your career in nonprofits. Yeah. In marketing. Why did you choose the nonprofit route and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, so growing up for forever, um, my passion was always uh, working in nonprofits, specifically working in children's education. Um, so really, really early on when I was 17, I moved moved to Argentina, wanted to learn Spanish, um, wanted to learn more about the Bible and then also dive into uh, to not the nonprofit world. Um, it was, it was kind of a rocky start. So I worked in, I don't know, probably like four or five, maybe even six different nonprofits, even like within like the first seven years of like from the, from 17, all the way to, all the way to 24. Um, and it was just kind of hitting frustration after frustration. I feel like I hit the frustration that a lot of people do with their nine to five, but with nonprofits of like not liking certain things, not wanting to be told what to do. The thing about the nonprofit world too is that depending on where you're going and who you're working with, it's very dictated by the donor. Mm -hmm. So if the donor's like, hey, I want you to go build a well over here, but you're like, no, this is the best place to build it, you can't build it there just yep. by default because they're the one that kind of like controls the money of it all, depending on the situation more or less. And then as a marketer, which is a lot of what I did is marketing for nonprofits is instead of like showcasing like, oh, this is all the fun stuff that we're doing. Like this is all the good that we're doing and this is how you can get involved or whatever. A lot of it's revolved around like going out to fundraising dinners, trying to find new donors, posting stuff that's very specific to like triggering people to donate, different things like that, rather than like, uh, let me just showcase what I've done and, and, and let people know and stuff like that. Um, so it actually took a, a pretty a pretty dark turn for me when I when I hit a lot of those frustrations of of not really fe feeling like I knew what I needed to do, feeling like I had good to do in the world and I knew that I had a good mission, I knew that I knew what I was doing, but then not really finding the the place that I could do it. Um so I hit a wall and really took a dark turn into like some I was this time I was living in um in Peru. I lived in Argentina for five years and then I moved to Peru for, for three years and just took a really dark turn, um, into like some crazy depression, just not really the depression that's like suicidal. That's like, I don't, I don't have a desire to live, but more of like the, I just don't know. I just don't have any desire to do anything. Right. Like I, it would take me, I wouldn't get out of bed. Um, I would just lay in bed, binge Netflix or whatever, or just do nothing. Um, and then, and I wasn't, like I mentioned, I wasn't like suicidal or anything because I still knew like there was something inside of me that knew like, Hey, I still have something not in like an egotistical way, but I still have some good to give to the world. And I feel like I have a mission and I feel like I have a purpose that I need to do. So it's selfish of me to take my life type thing. So I was like, that was never a thought in my mind or a desire. Um, and then just really got into a lot of, uh, a lot of drug addiction into, uh, as I mentioned, depression and the, into, um, into some, a, a lot of debt as well too, just because the situation or the way that I was kind of earning money wasn't necessarily ethical. I don't really tell people how I do it because you could easily still do it. Um, but it was, it was a, it was a weird turn in my life, um, for sure. I had, I had dabbled with drugs in high school, so it's not like it was something new for me. Um, but 
it was definitely like a, a crazy sucked into it for about eight months of my life. I just didn't know what to do, right? Like I didn't feel fulfilled by anything. I had kind of started a business in Peru that was this uh, delivery barber service. Yep. So I would have um, one of the one of the issues during that time was like the Venezuelan war. Uh, and like everything crazy that was going on in Venezuela. So there's a lot of immigrants coming to Peru. Um, and so I had built this barber delivery service. Venezuelans are uh, good at being barbers. Um, and so I built this barber service around Venezuelan barbers that wanted to cut hair, but weren't being accepted in like the traditional barber shops that were around the town already. So it was a delivery barber service where people would literally, where it'd be like Uber, they would like order their barber to their door. Um, I had no idea what I was doing because it was my brand first new business pretty much didn't really make any, anything probably had like five total clients the entire time that I was running it. But then I was also super unfocused. Like it was, it wasn't just didn't know what I was doing in business, but I was also during the time that, that I was, I was doing a lot of partying and, and drugs and all that kind of stuff too. So I wasn't super focused at all. Um, but those were kind of like my early days and experiences with nonprofits. Like it was I always have and still do have the mission of, of children's education um, in third world countries. And so, but the issue that I encountered multiple, multiple times was like, man, this isn't the way that I'd like to do it. And, and I, I had a small mind, right? Like I didn't really understand how the world works. So I didn't really understand how money worked or how, how you could actually build a business. And I was always thinking like, well, there has to be a nonprofit out there that works for me, how I want to do it. And then just after a while, um, while I was in Peru, COVID hit, basically, I was planning on actually moving back to Argentina and working at the previous nonprofit that I was at. Um, and it just thankfully ended up not working out because of COVID. Literally had moved all my stuff there, my dog, everything. And then I got stuck in Peru with an this apartment with like six people. It was like a two bedroom apartment. It was crazy. That's crazy. And Peru was wild during COVID, <laughs> like absolutely wild. Like they had restrict, it was so restricted that like, if you left the apartment, you could only go to like the grocery store and that's it. Like, that's the only thing that you could do outside of the house. And you could only go for like two hours wow. and men went on Tuesdays and Thursdays and women's went, went on Fridays and Wednesdays. Like those were the only days. And it was like completely segregated. That's wild. No restaurants were open, <laughs> banks, nothing. Like you had to go straight to the grocery store and then back home. And everyone was like, scared out of their mind because their hospital system collapsed in the first 48 hours oh my God. so so we were like leaving groceries outside the door washing our feet like some crazy stuff right yeah. i mean in hindsight then you're like well you'd... <laughs> who knows what it really was but you know um it we i mean we obviously did know that like hey if if we got it there's a big chance that we that we'd die there because they just didn't have any medical service we were just like watching videos on the news of like people being rolled out of their apartments on stretchers and into, into just literally straight into like pits because they didn't even have people where, where they could put all the, all the dead bodies. Like it was insane. I was like, is this the apocalypse? Like what's going on? We were all just shocked. But anyways, that was, that was a uh, little side story. Um, then from there I was like, well, maybe I'll do some like freelancing like during COVID. I was like, well, maybe I'll do some like freelancing. I can earn some money. And then when I earn that money, I can basically use that to, then I can go and volunteer anywhere and do whatever I want to. And I basically can manage my own time. I was like, okay, yeah, this could work. So then I just dove into the internet basically and was just starting to like research and I stumbled upon SEO and that was like, that was like what I decided to become my bread and butter. Um, That's funny that you say that actually, sorry to cut you off. I literally have one of my questions here is SEO is your bread and butter, like written down. <laughs> But yeah, sorry to cut you off. No, there. no. I mean, and I don't know why it's just, I guess it was just chance that it was the first thing that I stumbled upon because I had no idea what I was doing. Right. In hindsight, I probably wouldn't have picked SEO. Um, knowing all that I know now, I for sure wouldn't have picked SEO. <laughs> um, but it was, it was what did it for me at the beginning and what I found at the beginning. Um, and then that was my plan, right? Like I thought it was the best. I thought it was great. And I think one of the great things in life too, is that constantly adapting. And even if you thought like, Hey, this is my goal and this is where I want to go. Um, it can change, right? Yeah. Even when I talked to my, like my team and especially, especially a lot of my interns that I work with really closely, we do our monthly goals and, uh, our yearly goals. And I'm like, Hey, put out a yearly goal. 
and say for example it's uh i want to make ten thousand a month by the end of the year for for my interns or whatever um and then sometimes that changes because sometimes you get a deeper purpose of like oh i would like to do this instead or they're like actually it's 20 now because i already broke 10 a month ago right so yeah. one of the things about goals i think is important that sure if you have a goal that's that's perfectly fine having goals is great because then you have something to shoot for but they do change and it's fine changing them um and so it was just another form of like hey i can use this and i can still do my passion and what i'd like to do but it's just a different form of it and then COVID went through, I wasted a lot of time trying to like build an agency with like a website and, and, and brand and branding and logos and blah, blah, a ton of time, wasted time just doing the things that don't matter when I really should have just went out and got a client. Um, hmm. and, uh, this was, uh, three years ago, two years ago in, uh, January, I messaged, uh, Luke Belmar. Um, I actually met him in Argentina when he was about like 15 years old and I was 17, ironically enough. So that's how I knew him, um, had been following him for a while. And he's actually kind of the one that, that got me interested in the, in the marketing world. And that's kind of how I was like, okay, well maybe I'll try this online business thing. Um, I had actually even paid him for a, uh, for a consultation or mentorship call for my business that was the barber business. Mm -hmm. And then he came in and he was just like, hey, yeah, structured this way, this way, this way. And I was, it was just like phew, right over my head. I was like, sure, yeah, I'll do that. That's great. <laughs> Super valuable, appreciate it. Now I, I didn't even know what I was doing at the time, right? Um, but yeah, he had a mastermind going on in like April, April of two years ago. So April, 2021, somewhere around that range. Um, and he's like, hey bro, you, this is, this. you should come out to this. This would be, this would be good for you. And I was like, perfect. I used like the only money that I had made from being a freelancer and like I went all in, right? Um, because I just wanted, I just knew that I was older too, right? Like I'm 29 now, so I was 26, 27 then. So I had like some kind of like emotional and and social maturity to realize like, hey, I actually do need to get some answers and I need to have a good network of people that like align with my values and what I want to do. Um, so I went to it. And then I had this, I, I, for the longest time, I had this like really anti-capitalist point of view because I always thought of just like, I was always like nonprofit, nonprofit, mm -hmm. nonprofit, charity, 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 like making money is bad. Uh, you just need to go help people, like whatever. Um, and which money can, can money of course can be evil, but if you're using it for the correct thing, then it's not, right? Like it's just a tool. Um, so then Luke helped me quickly understand this, that I just had the wrong philosophy on like, he's like, yeah, you can make some money and then you can go and help these people, but you're one person and you have 24 hours in the day. And so you're only going to be able to do so much, right? He's like, if you were actually to like build a marketing agency and build a business, then you could take all of that money that you're making and fund and do everything that you want to do and then do it well. And it had made me realize like, yeah, I mean, like, sure, I want to do everything with excellence and I want to do everything well. So why wouldn't I take the route that helped me do it at an even higher level, right? So that's actually where the whole marketing game began for me. Like I would have no interest, even today, I have no interest in SEO and e-commerce and marketing for people. Um, it is simply a tool to the end of what I want to get to. Um, and so we've been able to fast forward um, two years from that point of the of the mastermind. Um, we hit 100 employees in my agency. Dude, amazing. Uh, we hit some crazy numbers. We've done over nine figures in e-com sales for the brands that we work with through SEO and, and Amazon. Um, and then we've been able, more importantly to me, we've been able to help a ton of different nonprofits with their marketing, um, with their, with educating them on how to do marketing, different things like that. And then now we're actually in the process this entire year of building my own nonprofit that I've been wanting to build from the beginning, uh, and actually building an education program for kids in South America. So that's one of the things that, that kind of just shows like one, you can do whatever you put your mind to if you have a North, but also like if you're able to 
understand how money actually works and how business actually works and the right way to actually utilize money as a tool, it money will come to you basically. Yeah, no, I mean, dude, as a, as a podcast host, it's always amazing when a guest gives you so much runway here. Yeah. I mean, you just quickly gave us the elevator pitch on your whole life <laughs> in maybe 10 minutes. And there's so many key points there that I want to go and talk through because I mean, I think it is an amazing story. And I think there was a lot of things that you mentioned there that are really important, like your ability to pivot, the ability for you to understand that things are things were rough, but you knew that there was always an end goal in mind. And I think that's where a lot of people falter. Like when things are going bad, they kind of just give up. But it's clear that you never had the intention to give up. You were kind of just going through that tough time in your life. And I also appreciate a guest who's always willing to talk about the tough times because I'm now a podcast host, but before I consume them, and every time you click it, it's always the amazing things, this awesome, I'm making millions of dollars, I'm living the best life. And life's not really like that. Like right. There's always struggle. So one, I do appreciate you being willing to open up and talk through that. And I think that's just a good place to start and then kind of unravel everything you just talked about. Yeah. But what was it like? Like, how did it feel when you were struggling in that time? What things did you learn about yourself during that point that are huge now to be the successful person that you are? Yeah, so I think part of it was, um, part of it was just like a frustration and like I was saying, just kind of like a desire to do nothing, but knowing that I needed to do something. But then also like this thought of like, I don't want to do anything. Like I'm just, I'm just fine being like a couch potato and just staying in bed until 12 o'clock and just going out and then partying and then coming back and sleeping all day. And like, I just had no desire to, to be productive or to work towards anything because it was just one of those things where I was like, why? Like, I don't know what to do. So why would I, why would I try? Why would I even try and go somewhere when I, when I have no idea what to do? Um, I think a lot of people do kind of have that mentality too of like, of like I know that I should be doing something and I know that I, I need to do something that's bigger than me and I know that I have potential. And one of the things that I've lear learned in the past, uh, the past few months actually is that it's actually really, really selfish to hold back the potential that you have and what you're able to give to the world. I mean, it sounds kind of egotistical, but it's not in any shape or form because what you're basically saying is like you were given life and you were put on this earth. And with that, you have a responsibility to have some form of impact that's outside of yourself on this planet. And you were given gifts and you were given, depending on where you were born and what family you were born to and, and what country you were born in for sure, like you were given an advantage, you were given opportunities, you were given a space to to be in you were given people to be around and the fact that you are holding back that potential that you were created with and that you were made with is selfish right like if you are like i'm just fine going to work every single day coming home playing video games and then going to bed and then tomorrow i'm going to work again coming home playing video games like you are literally being selfish because you were created and you were made for something so much bigger than that and the fact that you can't just like get your crap together mm -hmm. and figure it out and do it is selfish right yeah. and i just kind of felt that for a while i was like man i'm i know that i have something i just i kind of want to do me right now i want to do me i want to i want to party and i want to do this and and then another thing that I quickly learned as well is that um, this is just my kind of philosophy and how I view life is I don't really like doing things that I don't like to do, mm -hmm. right? which most people don't, right? Like, yeah. But the way that I was able to kind of mold that to how I live life now is I kind of do things that I want to do. Yeah. And then I'm able to leverage people and leverage my team and leverage the the resources that i have so that those things that i don't like to do that need to be done can be done by those people so that was something that i learned in that time is i do kind of have like a lazy bug of like obviously i i work and i work a lot but i do have like this lazy bug of like man if there's something that i don't want to do like i really don't want to do it You're not and i will do everything in <laughs> my power 
to try and figure out how not to do it. Like there's this exercise that I do every single month where I literally sit down and I write down all the tasks that I do on a daily basis, right? Like things that I do regularly, not like one-off things that just come out of the blue. And then I literally write down how much it costs. So I'll go on to like Upwork or, or, or Fiverr or LinkedIn or whatever, and I'll see how much a position that would do this job actually costs to pay someone an hour. So like say for example that I do a lot of copywriting on a regular basis every single day for like Twitter or whatever. And I'm saying, okay, every day I write tweets for an hour, okay? And then I go up and look what a copywriter costs. Oh, copywriter only costs 25 bucks, great. Um, someone to post the tweets only costs like two bucks an hour or whatever, you know? And I go down the list of everything that I have to do every day. Oh, I have to, you know, sit on team meetings. Great, that's not something I can really pay someone to do. So it's like a higher leverage thing. Um, I have to um, plan out what I'm going to do for LinkedIn ads. Uh, media buyer costs X amount of dollars. And I'll literally do that every single month. And every single position that costs less than what I make an hour, calculated by, by like my salary and stuff, I go out and I hire that person. And the reason for that being is because one, then I'm able to get those things off my pay plate and then leverage my time in a different way where I'm able to move the company forward. But then also there's like this innate thought in my mind of like, I really don't want to work and I really don't want to do those things. So I'm going to try and get and fill people up in those positions as quickly as I can so that I don't have to be the one doing them. Yeah. And then I can actually spend the time doing the things that that I'm passionate about. So that was something that I learned really quickly on. And that I think helped me a lot because a lot of people, they're just like a one man show and they're mm -hmm. like, I just need to grind this out. I just need to figure this out. I'll get it. I'll get it. And then they're doing everything right. Like they're doing, they're doing sales and lead gen and operations. And then, and then they're doing the accounting and the financing and then they're doing the, the advertising, like they're doing everything. And they're just like, man, I just want a hundred piece of the pot of the pot. Right. And I'm like, you know what, if I have 10 people and we all have 10%, I'd rather have 10 good people than me by myself doing everything, right? Yeah. I mean, even if you look at like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, like neither, none of them own more than 10% of any of their companies yeah. because they, they understand what it is to leverage people. And so that was something that I was able to kind of understand and that mo motivated me heavily. The motivation was literally just not to do things that I don't want to do. Like that was, so that was one of the things that I noticed in that time is that like, I get really drawn back and really, um, and really demotivated when I have to do things consistently on a daily basis that I'm not interested in doing. Yeah. And that's why nine to five didn't work for me. Yeah. Right. Um, so that was, those were, I guess were two of the biggest lessons of like understanding that it was like selfish of me in that way, not in an egotistical way, but just like the world, I, I was meant to bring something to help people and me not bringing that to my full potential is selfish to them. And, and me thinking about myself of like what I want rather than how I can impact whoever it is or whatever your mission is in life. Yeah, no. And I think two things from that one delegation and being good at delegating is a very common theme in the high level guests that I've had on the show because I'm always trying to take what are things that people continue to bring up? What are things that the successful people always bring up? And knowing how to delegate is something that comes up in every episode. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really smart because it's true. If, if you're constantly doing things that you don't like, I mean, what's more demotivating than having to do something you don't enjoy, but you going out and getting people to do the things that you don't enjoy and allowing you to go in and do the things that you actually like about your business are so motivating because mm -hmm. it's fun. You're excited. You're, you're interested. So I think that's really cool. And I, I think it's important for people that are listening and watching to understand you don't need to do it by yourself. And I think everybody suffers from that. Like you, you kind of got to go all in on one thing and then realize it's a shit show mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're trying to do all these different things. And then you'll realize, cause when I had my businesses early on, I struggled to delegate because I was like, I need it to be the quality that I'm used to. I need to do it the way that I did. I do it. And it took me a little while to get over it and just understand that let these individuals get a month or two under their feet and they're going to get up to speed. And me hiring people was what took the business from X to 10 X. Yeah. And so I think that's really important. And then two, it's funny, like when we're talking, 
when you were in Latin America early on, you said you were very closed minded. You were kind of trying to figure things out. And then now the way that you talk is so open minded. And I've been trying when you were talking, I was trying to think of a good word to describe it. And like spiritual, I guess, is the only word I could think of when you when you spoke about the way you looked at life and how you think it's selfish not to go and, and give the world what you what your talents are. And I think that's really cool. And like, where does that come from? I'm just curious at this point, where does that come from? Where does that kind of holistic view on everything? Because I think it's really interesting and I think it's really powerful because the mental part of things is so important mm -hmm. and you seem to have a very, very wide view on everything, not narrow, closed-minded. Where does that come from? Um, it sounds kind of weird, but I would say that one of the biggest ones is travel. And then another one of the biggest ones is just the experiences that I've had in life and the different like quote unquote, like crowds and niches that I've been. And, um, the, the reason, the way that I've been able to experience life is kind of like taking every single piece of what life consists of and like living in it in a while, like living in South America in a third world country, living in, a jungle where I slept on a dirt floor and only had two changes of clothes for, for three months living in high rises in New York that are worth millions and millions of dollars. So when you're, when you're going from all these different types of life, being in all different types of career and finance careers and in nonprofits and in trading, like I've been in a lot of different experiences and I think it just comes down to, and then I've traveled to a ton of different countries and lived in a ton of different countries. So it's allowed me to unlock information about the world that a lot of people that just stay in their hometown and never leave and, or just live at their parents' house and then never leave it or just whatever, whatever the situation is like people that are, that are very close to like, I only go here, I go to school here and then I've only worked here and I've only done this. Like, I feel like you have to, life is kind of like a game and you have to be able to explore the map and you have to be able to unlock new side quests and new missions to be able to discover what all of these things actually mean, right? So I've had all these different experiences that is then fed into me of like, okay, this is the perspective that I now have on life. And then just having good mentors and stuff too and having a good group of friends that helps you view the world in a different way, different ways and different places. And the internet helps with that as far as like getting friends that are from like different cultures and different countries. Um, but I would say the main reason for that is just, um, is for the experiences that I've had in life that they've been such, there's been such a wide variety of them. And then I've been able to experience like the lowest lows all the way to the highest highs. And, and I don't think you can get those things anywhere else, which is why I always tell people like travel, like go out, yeah. get out, visit places, go places that make you uncomfortable, go places where you have to, where you have to literally hide that you're white because you could get robbed type thing. Like go, go, go and experience the world. Yeah. And I mean, I couldn't agree more with you. Travel is so important. And I mean, my brother's here, our parents, were huge advocates on travel from when we were young. We were always going to different places. They were never keen on just traveling within the US, always mm -hmm. looking to see new cultures. And they empowered both of us at young ages, like go get out there. I mean, I think he went, I think he went to Spain with his friend at like 16. Just my mom put him on a plane and said, go see what Spain is like. And like, they've always empowered us to go and see these different cultures and put ourselves out there. And it's like one of the number one things I suggest to people because I find it just bizarre <laughs> when people are like, like you said, I only live in my hometown. I drive to my nine to five. I've, I talk to the same group of people I've talked to, which there's nothing wrong with that, but you're just cheating yourself yeah. from so much experience, so much knowledge. So I, I love that travels that because I, I think it is really important. You just learn so much because once you leave your bubble, I like to call it a bubble when yeah. you're in this like little world of the same people you see all the time, the same environment, like go get uncomfortable. I think that's a great way to put it. Like go be uncomfortable. And one, I think you're going to learn things about yourself. Like, I mean, you just gave us a perfect masterclass on look at all these things that you learned about yourself that all fed into the person that you are now. And a lot of it stems from the travel. Um, yeah. And then I'd, yeah. I'd say also like, do something that's like outside of yourself that doesn't make sense, right? Like 
go to go to Mexico, volunteer someone and build and build a house for someone. Like go to an orphanage and 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 go play with the kids and hang out there a day. Like go go to Africa and help build wells and and pass out food. Like do something that's selfless outside of yourself and that will give you the give you a perspective on the world like oh wow, it's not it's not all about me and it's not and there is more that's out there and there is more things that are going on and and my little bubble that where I all of my problems are really big all of a sudden mean nothing. Like all of a sudden me being un, unhappy about the Wi-Fi not working today is like, oh, wow, uh, this person has to walk miles and miles and miles just to go get their water every morning to be able to survive. Right. And then all of a sudden I'm upset about my Wi-Fi <laughs> being down five minutes. And it really just gives you a perspective on the world and on how you how you view things and what things actually become important to you and what things are actually worth worrying about. Yeah, and I had an experience in high school that changed my whole perspective and gave me the view that you just spoke about. I spent two weeks in Costa Rica, like in two and a half hours out of a city in this little town where there was one grocery store, one restaurant, one school. And I spent two weeks rebuilding the playground there with a company and I was just floored mm -hmm. by the experience. And two of the highlights from that were one, the same kids would come to the park every day while we were building and hang out with us and play. Yeah. And I mean, crazy enough, there's 60 people. There was only four people that spoke Spanish and I was one of the four. Yeah. So I was able to communicate with all the kids and talk. And I gave a kid $5 and I said, go to the grocery store because it was right there and go buy waters and stuff and take it to your friends. He bought a water for himself and he bought me a water and gave me the change. This is a little kid mm -hmm. who lives in a house that I could see right there, have a tarp for a roof. It's on cinder blocks. Yeah. And he's giving me the change back and I'm telling him no and he's refusing to take the money. This is like a nine-year-old kid who's right. so thankful of what I did but doesn't want to take more than what he needed just the water and I, I just I just started crying because I was like so emotional like I had spent days with this one kid it was it was such a crazy rush of emotion and then we played soccer with them and we're playing and having a great time they're all barefoot they don't have shoes right and there's rocks and their feet are bleeding and these kids are grinning ear to ear having right. the best time of their life and I looked at my friend and I was like dude holy shit like we bitch about the dumbest things back home and like, look at the quality of life that these kids are having with next to nothing. Yeah. Like, how can I go back home and not be so thankful? Like I'm not letting the Wi-Fi piss me off anymore. I'm not letting the traffic upset me anymore. Like the stupid things that just right. mean nothing. So I think it's really cool. Like that we just had that conversation there because I think it is really impactful. And I think an action item for people listening Get out of your bubble and go travel and go see these different places and don't go luxury travel. Like go see the different parts of the world from a different lens. You're connected to Luke Belmar. Yep. Most people know Luke. You had that experience. I think it's cool. And I do have a question on the barber and the consulting call that you did with him early on. But how did you get connected to Luke early on? And then what has that relationship turned into for you? Yeah, so the school that I went to in Argentina and uh, the nonprofit that I was that I was volunteering at, uh, he was from that small town. So I met him there when he was 15 or so. I was 17, um, and then that's where that's where I kind of started following him on social media. He was he actually didn't. I don't think he had social media then. I think I had found him later on, um, but he was just like dumb high school kid, right? <laughs> like messing around and and making the teachers pissed and stuff like that. Um, like I've, my brother-in-law was, uh, who's from Argentina as well. My brother-in-law was one of his camp counselors once. And he was just telling me stories of like how, what, what a troublemaker he was and blah, blah. And he was just a kid then like, right. Um, but yeah, that's how we first got connected then. And then, and then reconnected when I was starting to look into business, kind of messaged him and just started chatting and then was able to provide some value to capital club for him. And then the rest is history. And what value did you provide to Capital Club, if that's something that you can share? Yeah. So um, previously, what I would, what I was very helping, or what I was very focused on, 
was um, kind of like maintaining the current group that was in it. So like mm. the first group, there was like 11 of us and I was, um, I kind of made it my thing to like, okay, well, obviously he's a very, very, very busy person at this time. I had nothing going on with my business. So let me kind of like maintain this group. I would like set up like weekly calls with everyone so that we could all keep in check and then um, man, like just talking to them and seeing how everyone was doing and just kind of like the the day-to-day -day relationship management with them. And then now it's evolved into, um, I built this agency community, which you were at our event last night, um, which will then be um, basically trans transferred into Capital Club, their platform once it launches, and then I'll be uh, the agency partner for, for Capital Club, right? So yeah. that was kind of the value that I was able to provide for him at the beginning, something that I knew he was missing because he was busy and a lot of people don't know how to provide value. So there, there, it's really easy. There are really easy ways to do. Like if you see that there's something that needs to be done and that person's too busy to do it, then go out and do it. I could see that he was trying to build a community. He was trying to build people around him. He was trying to build Capital Club. Like it was our first mastermind only had like 11 people in it. It was just at the beginning of it. So I was like, hey, well, let me help him like manage this community and make them feel like they're still part of Capital Club rather than just like a mastermind and dip type thing. Um, and so that's, that's basically kind of what I did. I, and just really involved myself in the community and, and, uh, building relationships with them. And, and, um, yeah, that was kind of the value that I was able to bring to him at that time. And then now we're just, we're just great friends and we work on a different bunch of different projects together. So, yeah, that's great. And I, I wanted to highlight that because providing value is honestly not that hard when you can identify an area that you think there's a gap but so many people don't want to do it because I don't want to work for free. I'm not going to do something for somebody if I'm not getting anything out of it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest bottlenecks to success. Like look at what you just being proactive turned into, like you're speaking at Capital Club events. It's now a friend. You're building an agency business that's going to funnel into this all because you just wanted to provide some value right off the bat. Yeah. And I think that's really important for people listening and watching if you can identify a gap in something, if you're working with somebody who you want to be at their level or you want to be in that circle, just provide some free value. Like you'd be surprised what one or two nice gestures or just good value driving decisions or, or comments you can make can change. And like for me, when I would hire people for my businesses early on, it was always people who wanted to come work for me, not because I was looking for people. Mm -hmm. People would hit me up and say, hey, dude, I see this, this, and this in this Discord. You should do this. And I'm like, all right, implement it for me. And they'd do it. And it's like, you're hired. Like, it's now a paid role. And they didn't have to do that. I could have put up a job report and got 40 people who would come in, but they are the ones that found it. They wanted to own it. And I think that's really important for people. Like, go and provide value get in front of people. It doesn't matter how big they are, how big of a following, like people are always looking for an edge. People are always looking to take things off their plate. Like we talked about early on. And I think that's a great example. SEO is like your bread and butter. Like we said earlier, yeah. it's literally right here. SEO is your bread and butter. Give people listening and watching a little elevator pitch on SEO. So if they don't know, and then also explain why, why'd you pick SEO? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned kind of in my story, I kind of just stumbled upon it. Wouldn't recommend SEO to anyone. I'll give like a quick little elevator pitch for people that maybe if you have a e-com brand would be helpful for you. Um, but basically the idea is I kind of divide SEO up into three different pillars. Um, the main idea with SEO obviously is that you want to rank for keywords organically on Google. So for example, if I have a beef jerky brand, it'd be great to rank for the word beef jerky when people Google it not in those like first three sponsored ones. Those are PPC that you do through Google ads, but in the ones that come up right after. Um, and there's actually studies out there that show that around like 83% of the people actually skip sponsored ones and go straight to the organic. Yeah. So it's very valuable to be on those organic spots. And so what we do is we do, we, uh, do SEO for e-commerce brands that are doing over a million or 2 million a year. Um, and we try and rank them for some of those competitive keywords, some long tail keywords, different things like that. Specifically, like with that beef jerky brand, we're working with a brand where we're actually going after the word beef jerky, which is incredibly competitive, as you can imagine, <laughs> going after people like Jack Link, Stride, all those big brands that have been in the space for a while. Even Amazon and YouTube have are showing up for that for that word. So 
um, that would be something we would do. We'd bring on their company and then we'd find tons of keywords, not only just one, but tons of keywords that we'd want to rank them for. And basically the way to rank is those three pillars that I was mentioning. The first one is kind of like the on-site, uh, the on-site optimization where you're literally just going onto the site, optimizing their, their HTML code. You're optimizing, you're changing up their, their title tags and their, uh, and their meta descriptions, like just going in and really optimizing the content, their images, the page, the page load speed. You can use tools like, uh, Uber suggests or, or a refs or, or SEMrush to find what those errors are in your site. And then they'll actually even tell you how to fix them. Um, that used to be something huge back in the day, like 10 years ago, if you just did that, you'd rank number one for all the keywords that you wanted to. But nowadays with the rise in social media, and I, this is what I think it is because of the rise of social media, social proof and content is becoming king in marketing. Um, so that's where kind of like the last two pillars come in of like content creation and then backlinks. So content creation, the way to do that is just create an educational blog for your, for your website. So if you have a brand on beef jerky talking about like, Hey, these are the best ones to bring to the beach during the summer. And, mm -hmm. or this is how you can preserve and store and make, even make your own beef jerky or something like that. And writing blogs like that for your current audience, but then also writing them based on the keywords that you want to rank for. So that Google knows, oh, okay, you want to rank for beef jerky for summer vacation or mm -hmm. whatever. Once people are Googling that. Um, so then you'd write a blog about beef jerky for summer vacation. Um, so that's kind of where the content comes in is just letting Google know like, Hey, these are the words that I'd like to rank for. Please rank me for them. Yeah. Like putting hashtags on an Instagram post, like, Hey, this, this is what my post is about. This is what I'd like to rank for. And then the third one is backlinks, which is basically, uh, getting another blog or website to mention your blog or website. Mm -hmm. So once again, all related to social media, the best way to get out there is for people to share your stuff. Right. So it's the same exact thing on on Google is getting people to share your website, hyperlink it on a blog that they have or whatever they, they may have so that you get that social proof from them of like, oh, people are talking about me. Let me let me rank higher on Google and let me get a higher domain authority, which is what they call it on Google, a higher domain authority so that I can rank for those keywords that I already told you that I wanted to on the content, right? So with my agency, what we do is we do full stack, so we'll do all of those things, but we focus heavily on the backlinks, obviously, and then on providing good content because the backlinks are what is what's going to push you forward the quickest. Um, if you actually look on Google and say, how long does it take to rank uh, my site on S for SEO or with using SEO, um, the first article that pops up says that it takes six to 12 months. And one of the reasons that we've been so successful is we figured out how to do it in three months for our clients. And we actually have a, a three month guarantee with that as well. Um, so that if people come to us, we're able to guarantee that we'll do it twice or even three times faster than the industry standard. And the main idea behind SEO is there's not really tips and tricks with like PPC of like, oh, I have this strategy and I, and I do this VSL on this. Like for SEO, it's mainly just manpower. As mm -hmm. long as you understand like those three pillars and you're able to do them well, it's really just manpower. So whenever we bring a client on, we have seven developers and seven people that are working on our client's website simultaneously doing all those things that I was talking about so we can get them done faster than if you go and hire someone on five, one freelancer on Fiverr and Upwork to go through those that list and do all of them. Um, so that's kind of what we do with SEO and how, if you have an e-com brand, you can rank as well. You can also go through and do all those things. It will take you longer than us, obviously, because we got the manpower. Um, but that's what was able to scale my agency as I just found a really good offer. I found what people were frustrated by of like SEO takes too long. And then I figure out how to do it faster and then add a guarantee to it. And then we also just, we also added on uh, conversion rate optimization so that when people are actually coming to the site, we're actually bringing traffic that converts and not just random, not just random window shoppers. Mm. Um, and we were able to convert on them higher. And then at the same time, like the good communication, uh, and then just really driving focus on driving revenue to these companies rather than just being like, Oh yeah, look at all these clicks and visitors that I got for you. Um, so that's what we do specifically with SEO. And then I was able to acquire after growing my, my agency, uh, as I mentioned, I was able to acquire an, an Amazon agency. And then now all, we also do uh, Amazon marketing for, once again, brands that are doing 
at least 30K or so a month, a uh, million a year, and we'll come on, optimize listings, manage PPC, uh, help you get reviews, um, optimize your 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 store images, different things like that, do your SEO for Amazon. Um, and it's, it's been pretty good so far uh, up to this date. We've done multiple nine figures in sales for our clients. Um, so it's been a, it's been a good, it's been a good role. Um, SEO is great. I wouldn't recommend people getting into it. Uh, I, I am thankful for it just because it's got me to where I am today, but it's, uh, in my opinion, it's the hardest marketing service to sell on the planet, uh, because you're selling like basically like an IRA to someone of like, Hey, if you put $5 in for the rest of your life, then eventually you'll be able to cash out a million, which for me, it's very good for a business. Um, but you have to be able to have the, the capital to do it and you have to be able to maintain it for a while. Yeah. And I know one of the, uh, I guess secret sauce is a good way to put it is you own 70,000 websites and that's a great way to backlink. And so we have a partnership with 70,000 oh, websites, okay, okay, right? Okay. So, so since understand. we've been doing the backlinking for so long of like the only way to do backlinking, like you can do black hat or gray hat and you can go out and buy backlinks or find like a network of backlinks or whatever. Um, and that's actually in the eyes of Google, it's illegal to buy backlinks. So it's a sticky business if you go out and do that, because if it's like buying followers on Instagram, like if Instagram ever finds out they ban you and then you're gone yeah. with Google, it's much worse because they ban you from Google and then you don't want to be gone from Google, no. right? Like then no one can ever find you. Yeah. Um, so it, the way that we do it is organic backlinking. So we'll actually send out thousands and thousands of emails to these sites that ha that are inside the niche of our clients. So once again, if it's like a beef jerky client, then we'll reach out to a Boy Scouts blog that they like to take beef jerky on their backpacking trips or whatever and be like, hey, we noticed that you have snacks for a backpacking trip. Would you like, would, could you mention us on your site? And so we'll send out thousands of emails to websites inside their niche to try and get them on these sites and get them these backlinks. And then since we've been doing that for so many years now, we've just made good connections with tons of websites where we're able to come back to them constantly and say like, hey, this is this, 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 and this. Would you like us to bring you future clients? Uh, would you like us to bring future backlinks in the future? Or would you like us to bring more of our clients? And they're like, yeah, I'd love to be on your list. So we have a list. It's probably more than 100,000 now of websites where we're able to just, for in every single niche, be like, hey, I have a beef jerky, beef jerky client again. Can you add them to this blog? Or hey, I have a, a hat brand now. Can you put them in this blog? And then they're always just like, yeah, because they trust us and we've built a good a uh, good relationship with them. And what does the backlink, what does the the other company get from having you come on? Like what's the incentive for them to backlink you? So blogs generally make their money off of visitors, right? Mm -hmm. And you only get visitors by writing good content unless you're pushing like ad traffic or something to it. So like for a, a blog of a, a mom blog where she's just writing about her kids or like a travel blog where they're just writing about like their travels and stuff. Like the only way that you're going to get visitors and traction and people to read it is if you have good content, just like any themed Instagram, right? Like if I have a travel Instagram, the only way I'm going to get followers is by posting good content. Um, so they're always constantly looking for the next best thing mm -hmm. and good content to post on their blog. So if I'm able to bring them good brands that are quality brands that they're clients could invest in, then their cl then their their clients or their visitors, their traffic, trust them more because of their recommendations and their positive recommendations and everything. And blogs generally, it's generally a hobby or they can make money off of like the AdSense, off of visitors coming onto their site or off of affiliate links of like posting affiliate links for our clients so that they get a percentage kickback of every single piece that we sell that comes from their website. There's a diff bunch of different ways that they can uh, make money off of that as well. So that's kind of like what their what their goal is. It's kind of like those themed Instagrams where they where they charge people to to post their products or whatever on yeah. there because that's how they make their money is from getting good people on there. Okay, cool, cool. You're an author, which is really cool. You wrote the art of client acquisition. Mm -hmm. What was it like to write a book? Uh, I wrote it kind of on a whim. It was not planned at all. I was writing out, I was going to write a PDF, just like a free PDF that I wanted to give out to agency owners of my uh, strategy of how I grew my agency, like through the lead gen all the way to the sales. 
um, all the way to the signed contract. And so I just started writing one day and I was like, yeah, I'm just going to write this out and then give it out to people just so that they know how I did it. Um, and then this was uh, right before the, the, the second Capital Club uh, mastermind in Albania. And I was just kind of talking to people and they're like, yeah, you should just make this into a book. And I was like, all right, yeah, I could do that. And so then I just kept writing and kept writing. And all of a sudden it's a bunch of pages, hired an editor, they went through it. Um, and it's rather than like a like a, a book of like marketing theory or anything, like it's really just kind of like a step-by-step of like, this is what I did. This is what you should do. Like literally walked people through like, this is how you create your ad. This is how you go and create the ad copy. This is how the text that you should put on it. This these are, Here are examples of all the text that I put on it. This is go into go high level. This is the automation that you set up. Like I literally just walked people through like my strategy. So it's not really like a marketing or like leadership or anything in or like theory um kind of book it's more of just like a this is my strategy and if you have a marketing agency just follow this and then do it and then you'll be fine um it has changed quite a bit because i wrote that book last year so i generally recommend people to to watch either some of my new content or um or just ask me for what the strategy is because it it has changed a bit um but yeah that was kind of like the idea behind it of like I'm just going to create and tell people how I do it. And then at, I was speaking at that capital club as well about that, this topic specifically. And they're like, yeah, you should just put this into a book and then sell it. And I'm like, sure, why not? And then launched it. And that, that same exact day, uh, it became a number one bestseller as a, and I think it was in like digital marketing in the digital marketing cap- category on Amazon. So pretty cool. I even, I even went above the hundred million dollar offer book from Hormozy. So I was like, sick. I mean, it was just for a couple of days, but hey, it was worth it. <laughs> hey, you got to celebrate anyone, yeah. right? And like, I was about to say, the way that you described it gave me Hormozy kind of vibe from like the way that you write the book. He writes his book very simple. Yeah. Tries to give you, I mean, it's not free. You got to pay for the book, but a lot of game in $14 or $15, whatever it costs. So yeah. it's cool that you, you wanted to do that. And I keep going back like as we talk and listening to the the way that you describe things and kind of trying to pick apart like where it all comes from I get a lot of like what you said early your passion for helping kids and and wanting to empower and young individuals I think you're doing all that just maybe a little older like you're you're (laughs) empowering 18 to 24 year old kids um because I think everybody's a kid at heart so I, I hate people that get offended for being called a kid. If you're in your mid twenties, I want to be a kid forever. <laughs> um, but I think it's really cool. Cause like you kind of found this happy medium, like started in the nonprofit world because you wanted to help people and you wanted to help indiv- young individuals. And now you've scaled up to a very successful individual in business with a huge network of amazing people. But the goal is still to help young people go out there make money make something for themselves. And I think that's really cool. And I always love talking with people who are, are willing to give information and help. Like you're giving so much free game here for people listening. Like this is free. I mean, I like to say it's not free, like subscribe. That's the way you pay me back. But, um, you're giving so much free game and like, how does that make you feel? I always try and ask guests, like, how does it feel to know that you're making an impact and that people are paying their bills, putting food on the table for their family, helping family members out, off the back of information that you're get putting out and helping. Yeah. I mean, like, kind of like I said, like, it's not about me. It's not like this, this egotistical, like I get, I get a dopamine rush off of it or anything. Like, yes, it is more, it's more fulfilling than just making money and then using that to go out and buy a Lambo or whatever. I'd much rather use my, my money f- to be able to help people. But it's one of those things, as I mentioned too, is that, that I was, I was created to be able to have an impact and be able to be selfless and help people, right? Like it's not, it's not about me. It's not about what I have to offer. It's about the fact that, that I, that God put me on this planet for a mission and to do something. And it would be selfless, selfish if I were not to do it rather than me being like, Oh, look at me. This is all I'm doing for people. No, like I just, I just know that I like helping people and that it's what I find actual enjoyment to. And then I really like community. Like I like being around people. I like networking. I like, um, talking to people and then being able to offer value to them. Right. Like I, sometimes I'm, I'm that way to a fault where I go above and beyond for someone that doesn't actually 
uh, actually uh, appreciate it or, or use it at all. And it happens to me all the time, but it doesn't bother me at all because I'm not in it for the results that I get, that I'm able to give to people. And I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong. They're like, they're like posting all the good results of like, oh, look at this person that I was able to help and they're able to do this. Or look at now this person's making this much money. Like, I mean, for all the people, the thousands of people that are in my community, I'm fine with the people that don't have results too, because it's not like, it's not like I'm only going to get excited off of the ones that get results. Like I'm here to help them, whether people accept it or not. Mm -hmm. Like, just like with your podcast, you're here to talk to people, whether they're going to listen to you and learn from it or not. It's just the, the desire that you have for, for doing it and for being able to put out this information. Um, so it's one of those things where I'm just like, I know I have something to give to people and it's actually selfish not to do it rather than selfish to do it. Um, and I think it just ties back to the fact that, yeah, what you were saying, like, yeah, I started off in the nonprofit world and I'm still very, very involved and still very interested in that. And that hasn't changed, but I've been able to find a, a niche inside of business as well, where I'm also able to, to help people and work with people. And I think that people don't really understand that life is really just about people. Like that's all it is about is, is, is loving, is loving people and caring about people and um, if you, if you're not able to understand that in business as well, you're just not gonna, you're not gonna do too well. Um, because at the end of the day, like your team is built and comprised by people. Uh, the people that you're selling to are people. Um, the, the things that you want to do in your life are all surrounded by people. And if you're not able to treat people properly, um, and actually genuinely invest in them and understand what their needs are, you're not going to be successful in business. Like I'm selling marketing services to people. Sure, I'm making money from it, but I'm selling them to people because my marketing services are going to help them achieve their dreams and grow their businesses. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a marketing agency, mm. right? Like I'm not just charging money to charge money. Like yeah. it's to help them. My team, I am bringing on training and hiring because it's empowering them to do their job better, but it's also empowering them to feed their families and to, and to get the fulfillment that they want in life. Like business is about people just as anything is about people. So if you don't understand that concept of like, you are always in the game of helping people, it doesn't matter who it is, then you're going to completely miss the mark, right? Like you're not going to create a good team. You're not going to have a good culture. Uh, your clients are going to be unhappy with you. Like you really just need to focus on like providing value to people and seeing how you can be selfless in the way that you're going about things, not expecting anything in return where you're actually giving that help. Man, I think it's spot on. Like, and I, I'm in sales, like we talked about, and a very common thing people will tell you is people don't buy from the brand. They buy from the person. Yeah. You will win a deal because you were more personable, more enjoyable to talk to, just an overall better person than your competitor, even if their solution might be better than yours. Right. Because that individual knows that now he needs to talk to whoever he bought that from. He's going to have to talk to them for the year, two year, three year, whatever the contract is. Are you going to are you going to talk to somebody that you don't enjoy at all? Are you going to talk to somebody that's really nice and that you enjoy speaking about and actually cares about the conversation? You're going to go with the person you enjoy. Right. So, I think it's great that you just highlighted that. I mean, people being a good person is so underrated. It's crazy. Like the amount of rooms I've gotten into, the amount of conversations I've had just because people are like, "Dude, you're really genuine. You should meet these people." Like you're really like, even last night, just walking around, like, I'm not embarrassed to go to somebody and be like, then this is crazy. This is so out of my comfort zone. Like, but really nice to meet you and have a genuine conversation. Like, what are you doing? Like, what's working for you? How, why are you successful? And it's it, like I said, being a good person is so underrated and so undervalued that you could get so far just by being a great person and sticking yourself in situations and just being genuine. Yep. And I want to get into something that I think people are really going to enjoy and, and want to hear. I'm definitely going to butcher the name Kara. I got it right? You got it right. Okay, perfect. So Kara and Adeptio, which Adeptio is the parent company to um, the now I'm gonna, the agency domain. Mm -hmm. And you built these companies up. What was it like scaling them? What were some of the ways that you were able to scale them for people listening who have an agency, who want to grow their agency? 
this is probably a good time to, to drop some golden nuggets here in the later. I always like to leave the good questions to the end. So I incentivize people like, hey, stick around because there's always good stuff in the back. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what I teach in my community as well. I have a community of, of, of a couple thousand uh, agency owners. And what I try to do is I teach people that are either starting from zero, we call it like zero to exit. So whether you're starting from zero, you're at 100K a month, you're at... 50k a month, whatever it is, we're doing. We do coaching programs and uh, and live streams with with uh, big names in this space to be able to bring you the best information and the best network, right? Like I basically just created the community that I wish that I had when I was starting off my agency, um, and so so that I could provide people with that information that I wish that I had starting off and would have saved myself tons of time. And then also the network of like agency owners and people that are looking to grow agencies and people that are looking to, to grow in this space so that they can all have like that ecosystem of like, we're all going in the same direction. Um, so that's what I actually teach inside that community. But one of the things is one of the strategies that I have, and I have two different ones, but I'll just dive into one of them right now um, for people that are starting from zero. And this is actually how I started from zero as well. Um, is what I would do is I'd literally just be kind of like a middleman for someone that was already doing the work. Um, so when I was in my research journey, I found Upwork, um, which is similar to like Fiverr, just a little bit higher quality. I, and I went on there and then that's what I was, where I was starting to look for my SEO job. So I was like, okay, who needs SEO? I'm going to start applying for jobs so that I can do SEO for them. I get a, I get my first client, they pay me, whatever. I start doing the work and I quickly, quickly realized, like I mentioned to you, um, that I don't like doing the work, right? Like I really don't like fulfilling clients. I don't like to talk to them. Um, and so like after like a month of doing the service, I was like, I need to hire someone to do this because I'm not doing this. And that's actually the only client that I've ever serviced ever in like the history of my agency. Um, and so what I, what I actually did is I went on to Upwork and I found people that were offering SEO as a service that had like the full package built out that like, Hey, I charge this a month. These are all the services that I offer. This is what I do. Here's my case studies, my reviews. And then I would take, I would talk to them. I would interview a bunch of them and I'd be like, okay, well, would you want to, would you want to team up and then I'll go find clients for you and I'll just bring them to you not exclusive. You can work for whoever else you want to. You can work for yourself. I'll just bring you some extra clients. How much do you charge? Oh, great. You charge 500 bucks a month. Perfect. And then I would go to the other side of Upwork for people that were looking for employees and or looking for people doing SEO. And then I would just apply to a ton of jobs with this person's case studies and reviews because they were the one doing the job. And I would just apply to a ton of jobs. And then they would hire me. I'd be like, yeah, it's 2000. And then I would pay this person 5,000 and I would keep what was left. And that is literally how I started my marketing agency. Eventually built, built up a couple freelancers. Um, and it was a way for me to kind of like leverage someone else's labor so that I didn't have to do it. But then there was no risk involved, right? Like if this person didn't pay me, I didn't have to pay this person because they were working as like a contractor for me. Yeah. Right. And, or if, or if this person wasn't able to fulfill the job, then I refunded them and they refunded me mm -hmm. because it was all on the Upwork platform. So there was no risk at all involved for me. And then I was able just to build up cash in order to then build out an actual company and partner up with people uh, and partner up with my partner that helped me escalate my business. Um, but that was the that's the strategy that I recommend people doing is like figuring out what service you want, whether it's like doing Amazon marketing, doing email marketing, doing SMS, whatever it is, going to find some, well, first you have to figure out how to do it because you need to be able to manage that person and understand what they're doing. Finding someone that does it well, that has like a full package built out. Sometimes it's someone in a third world country because generally they'll charge cheaper, but still have a really good service. And then you can still be the face of it. And then going out and finding someone that also needs that and being like, yeah, I charge this amount and then paying them the rest. And then once you get some cash in the bank, then that gives you the ability to actually scale and become a leg legitimate business. I'm not a fan of like the, let me do a free trial for you or, or pay or like a commission based of like all oh, you can pay me per lead or based on how much I get you or like a, I'll work for free for a case study. Like that's not my vibe and that's not what I like to do because the, the thing about it for me is that it immediately shows the person that you're working with that you're an underdog immediately yeah. and that you're a nobody. 
so that when they, even if you do get really good results, they're going to go to their friend and be like, Hey, I gave this dude a chance, paid him 500 bucks. Now he's doing all this work for me. He's really good. You should consider it too. And then all of a sudden this person, your next person that's a referral looks at you as an underdog now too. Right. And so you, you lose all authority for what, for a case study and maybe to get a few extra bucks in the cash and sorry, a few extra bucks in the bank when you could literally go and leverage someone else's results and someone else's talents, work with them, and then advertise those as your marketing agency service, right? And that's, we do that now at a higher, at a higher scale where we're actually going out and looking for marketing agencies that are functioning, that aren't scaling well, and then we'll actually purchase them and bring them on into our marketing agency as kind of like a shortcut of like, look, now we have all these reviews. Now we have all these employees. Now we have all of these uh, case studies that we didn't do, but we're able to utilize them to go out and find new clients, right? So it's kind of that that same exact strategy, but without the risk involved of it, of having to buy a huge agency or, or, doing, or doing work for free and leveraging your time, right? Like that's just not my method. So that's one of the methods that I teach people how to do and the, like the step-by-step -step process of what they need to do, how they build it out everything because it's the way that I started my agency, maybe a little bit different than what I teach now. There are some more tweaks to it just because I've learned how the industry works. Um, but I wouldn't have done it any other way. And I wouldn't teach people to do it any other way because it's the best way to, to do it. And you literally just have to, to grind for a couple months and do that. Just apply to tons and tons of jobs and you can make some good money, right? Like if you think about it, like getting to th getting to 30k MRR, all it takes if you're doing it in three months, all that takes is if you're selling a package for two thousand bucks, all that is 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 15 clients, right? Yeah. 15 clients by three months, that's only five clients a month. That's only that's basically a, a little bit more than a client a week. Really, not that hard to do if you're if you're literally prospecting in a group of people that are already looking for your service, like. On Upwork, they are posting about I need SEO, I need Amazon, I need I need email marketing, and you're just saying like, hey, I I have the best I have the best team to do it for you. Let me do it, dude. I mean, for people listening, I hope you're taking notes and and taking some of that because I mean, you just described a way for somebody listening right now, and I think this is just a cool thing to highlight. Just the internet. I mean, this is a small podcast at the moment. Hopefully by the time the episode comes out, it, it's, it's a lot bigger, but you could watch this video and spend 45 to an hour of your day on, on a weekend or, or whenever you have some free time and just do exactly what you said and go to 30K a month in three months. And this was completely free. No barrier to entry, nothing special. Anybody could have clicked this and listened to it. And I think that's so powerful. And I, again, I think it's really cool when a guest is willing to provide that value because some people like to gatekeep it or, or not let people in. I mean, you just outlined an easy way for somebody to go out. Not easy, that's a bad way to put it, but if you want to grind it out, a good way to go start creating a quality service-based business. Yeah. This has been an amazing conversation. I've got just one simple question um, to kind of wrap things up. And I also am giving you a gift. I give every in-person guest a gift and I forgot to bring it. So here's my, uh, can you go get the gift uh, while, while we answer this question? Um, but it's very simple. Like you, Zach, what are you excited about in the near future? What's coming? Like what's in the roadmap? What are you really pumped about? Um, I'm pumped about my community. Like I said, I'm, I'm building a community that I wish that I had when I was starting off my agency. So I'm pumped to be able to help uh, help people in that, in my industry, be able to become successful. And like, even with the pop-up last night, like I just love that stuff of being able to network people and, and talk to them about their businesses and seeing where they're started and then being able to connect people locally. Like the reason that I do like the, the meetups and stuff like that is that when you're bringing all these people together in the same location, it's some people that might be, maybe just live in their own little bubble and don't know people that are entrepreneurs in their area. Yeah. Right. So it gives them a chance to connect with local people and then they can be build relationships, become friends with them and then actually grow their business and stuff. So that's, that's one of the things that I'm excited about is being able to build the community. It's something that AI is never going to be able to replace community. So yeah. it's something that I think is timeless. Um, and then obviously, as I mentioned, I'm in the journey of of creating my nonprofit right now. And that's a really exciting time for me. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to 
what happens uh, with that and where where it goes. That's awesome. Again, I mean, thank you so much for this conversation. Let's give me one of the boxes. Let's let's you can get on camera and make it your your debut here. <laughs> Here's the gift for you. Um, this is we were at the cigar bar last night. Yeah. This is uh, my best friend's brand, El Mago oh, Cigars. Cool. Um, it's been a year. It's got an amazing story behind it. He started this as a tribute to both of his grandparents right here. Um, they were mentors and really good friends of his. Unfortunately, they passed away in the collapse in that building in Miami. And he has now created this amazing moment, like memoir, um, for them to just continue to have their story. This is the passports from their actual passport of all the oh, countries cool. that they lived in in their journey escaping cuba and making it to the united states so very cool this I is for that. you um thank you i like to i like to give people something nice i mean you you gave me the chance to come interview you you gave this amazing setup and yeah i did um and it's just a way for me to say thank you um yeah absolutely and dude this was this was amazing like i i learned an, a lot so i hope there's people watching and listening who learned too because there's a ton of things that I'm going to go and implement into my podcast and try and continue to blow this up organically. So appreciate you hosting. Appreciate you having me come out to the event last night. It was an amazing event. Yeah. I think that community's literally just at the start and I can't wait to see what happens. And something I always like to say at the end of every episode is I'm really excited because now I get to watch your journey from a personal lens. I know you, I met you. We just spent an hour and a half, an hour talking face to face. So I'm really excited for you. I can't wait to watch this journey of you building all of this out from a more personal lens. And I think you're going to absolutely crush it. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you crushing the podcast game. Thank you so much, <laughs> man.